Anybody familiar with the name Thomas Dorsey? Thomas Dorsey was a jazz musician from Atlanta who was known in the early 1920s for combining original music and very suggestive lyrics. Yeah, Tommy Dorsey, he eventually became famous as Tommy Dorsey. God began to work in his life and in 1926 he became a Christian and his life changed. He decided to give up the suggestive music. In 1932, times were hard and Dorsey was trying like everybody else to survive the depression but his past music, both the lyrics and the, the musical style, made a lot of people say, well, this is just not godly music. And he was going through a really hard time. In fact, in 1932, three years after the Depression began, he was here in St. Louis on what would become the worst night of his life. He got a telegraph informing him that his pregnant wife had died. He was a young Christian. He was trying to do the right thing. He was, he was struggling to put it all together. And then he got that news. Instead of wallowing in hopelessness, although his faith was shaken, he sat down and he penned the words of a song. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak. I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Many of us have sung that song before, but we didn't know where it came from. And out of the pits of his despair, Thomas Dorsey wrote that here in St. Louis in 1932. Now the reality is, although we can't completely relate to what Dorsey was going through, the reality is everybody here has had some tough things happen in life, haven't you? Some things that you didn't know how to handle. Some things that... If we're honest, some areas where we created a mess. We, we made a mess of things. And we needed second chances. Anybody here ever needed a second chance? We've all been there. In fact, and Joe, you were right. Sometimes we need third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and sixth chances. We have all been there when we needed a second chance. And aren't you glad that God gives second chances? and third and fourth and fifth. If you will, find Joshua chapter 20. This morning is actually the final sermon in my series on Joshua. I want to read a passage that is really, it's, it's a little different. It's dealing with a, a concept from the Old Testament law called cities of refuge. And it has a really important application for us today. So if you would, let's follow along. Uh, Joshua chapter 20, we're going to read the first nine verses. The Lord said to Joshua, Now tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as I instructed Moses. Anyone who kills another person accidentally and unintentionally who caused the death will appear before the elders at the city gate and present his case. They must allow him to enter the city and give him a place to live among them. If the relatives of the victim come to avenge the killing, the leaders must not release the slayer to them, for he killed the other person unintentionally and without previous hostility. But the slayer must stay in that city and be tried by the local assembly, which will render a judgment. And he must continue to live in that city until the death of the high priest who was in office at the time of the accident. After that, he is free to return to his own home in the town from which he fled. The following cities were designated as cities of refuge. Kadesh in Galilee, in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. On the east side of the Jordan, across, the Jeric across from Jericho, the following cities were designated. Bezer in the wilderness of the plain of Reuben, Ramoth in Gilead, in the territory of the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan, in the land of the tribe of Manasseh. 
These cities were set apart for all the Israelites as well as the foreigners living among them. Anyone who accidentally killed another person could take refuge in one of these cities. In this way, they could escape being killed in revenge prior to standing trial before the local assembly. Would you pray with me, please? God, open your word to us this morning, and I pray that we would learn some historical facts, but God, I pray that that's not what would touch us the most. But God, that you would also teach us how you have always been a God of second chances, willing to give mercy and show mercy when we mess up. In your name I pray these things. Amen. This morning, as we focus on how God offers second chances, I want to begin with the fact that's the first point in your notes if you're following along there. I want us all to understand that God offers us mercy. The nation of Israel at this point had an army. They had just conquered the promised land. But what they didn't have was a police force. They didn't have a legal system in the same way that we do. They had the Old Testament law that God had given to Moses that had now been taken with them and Joshua as he now has become the leader. They've now conquered the land. They are now setting up the government within the land. And as they do that, they go back to the book of Numbers, the 35th chapter. And if you want to look this up later, you can. Numbers 35, 25 to 32 gives the details of how they are to establish cities of refuge. Now to understand what's happening here, you need to remember that the Israelites are a young nation. They don't have a well-established legal system with lawyers and judges, no elaborate rulings to deal with every possibility. What they did have is the law telling them how things are supposed to work. And one of the principles dealt with was what happened in the event that somebody was maliciously killed, put to death. And the rule had been at this point that if, if somebody was killed, actually the family could go after that person who did the killing and put them to death without any retribution. Because they did not want to allow people who, to murder other people without consequences. In fact, what's going on here, it, this, uh, I want to share some background to help you understand the impact of this ancient teaching about the cities of refuge. Look at this next statement in your notes. The ancient rule for dealing with tragedy was called lex talionis, or the law of retribution. It said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and life for life. It was a huge step forward because punishment often wasn't proportionate. In other words, somebody would accidentally kill somebody and then the family would take it out on the person who, had accident, who was guilty of manslaughter, basically. The penalty for murder was that it was the right of the family of the person who murdered to basically avenge the death. And it wasn't done through a legal system, so even if it had been an accident, the family of the person who accidentally died might come after you and there was nothing you could do about it. Instead, justice carried out by the family instead of by the legal system like it is today. I think you'll find this little bit of background quite interesting. Look at the next statement in your notes with me. The word avenger comes from the Hebrew word gal and literally means next of kin. So the idea of the next of kin, if you accidentally put somebody to death, you were working, and the hammer slipped out of your hand as you're working, and it hit somebody in the head, that family before this time could come after you. They could say, well, I think it probably was, it was probably intentional. But after this, the, we're, they're going to change things. Things are actually going to be very different because God is demonstrating some mercy. He's helping them to understand. Prior to the Mosaic Law, there was no provision for these unusual situations. However, after the law introduced the cities of refuge, that all changed. It was a new principle that was quite revolutionary because it changed the way the legal system worked. In fact, I want to show you just how revolutionary this idea would ultimately come. Look at the final statement on this first point. The city of refuge concept is the basis for the principle at the core of our present legal system, which is that the accused is innocent until proven guilty. Now, if you are charged with something, you are considered innocent. You're not convicted until you have been tried in court. 
So the hammer comes out of my hand as I'm working and it slings across the room and hits Terry and kills him tragically. No longer can Kim and Terry's family get together and say, we're going to kill the preacher. I, I, like this, I like this new rule. Okay? Instead, I'll be examined. I, I will go to these cities of refuge and I will be examined and Terry's family can come and say, here's what happened and here's why we think it was an intentional thing. And then there will be a court, a, a jury of my peers in this city who will pass judgment and say, well, we think it was intentional and then I would I'd be put to death. Or we think it was an accident, it was not malicious and there will be some justice for that, but it will not be the same level. So this was a really big thing. This changed things and actually set the precedence for innocent until proven guilty that we enjoy today. Before this, people would dish out judgment and then ask questions later. Now, there was still a dead person. There was, there was still some penalty, in fact. Should the person involved in the death, even if it was an accident, escape scot-free? Well, in our own culture, if you are guilty of manslaughter, are there consequences? Absolutely, but they're not the same consequences, and that's what actually happens here. Look at the second principle in your notes. Mercy doesn't remove all consequences. Mercy meant that there would be mercy shown, and God offers us mercy, but there are still some consequences that go along with mistakes, sin, bad behavior. I want you to think through what would happen when an accidental death took place. The person accused of the murder would have to be on the alert because at that moment he was fair game in this ancient new system. And he would have to take off for a city of refuge. And the implication of the cities of refuge was that the unfortunate person would make a beeline for the closest one. Because until they were there, the family could still take their life. But once they got to the city of refuge, they would be protected. In fact, the city leaders would hold a trial. They would examine the evidence, evidence surrounding the death to determine if the death was accidental or intentional. And if the death was deemed to be malicious, then there was an execution. But if the person was, was found to be innocent, that it was unintentional, there was mercy shown, but there were still consequences. What would happen is that the person who had been judged guilty of manslaughter wasn't sent to prison like they would sometimes be in our system, but they actually had to stay in the city of refuge. So their life changed, but their life wasn't over. There were consequences, but the consequences were not impossible. Now, on one level, we look at that and say, well, that doesn't really seem fair. Really, what was going on here was that God did not want to minimize death, because death is a big thing when it's caused by someone. But at the same time, there needed to be mercy. But I do want you to understand something, and this is the first statement under that second point. There are always consequences for sin, even when sin isn't intentional. How many of you have ever done something and you didn't realize when you did it that it was a mistake till afterwards? I had a friend that almost did that very thing. Can you remember, it's probably been around 30 years ago. I was a, still a young man at the time. And I was working for my dad in a sawmill. And I was working with a young man and he, we were cleaning up on a break. We were sweeping up all the sawdust. And this young man set the, he was, he was pushing a broom and he set the broom against a piece of machinery and it fell. And without even thinking about it, he reached to grab the broom and he reached into the saw. But you know how that, there is a moment in your head when you're doing something that you know, oh, this is not good before you even, you know what, I'm, you know how it is when you stump, you stump, you, you kick something with your toe and there's that instant where you know it is really going to hurt, but it hasn't started yet. Everybody know what I'm talking about? I did that this week. <laughs> I stubbed my toe and I thought, oh yeah, it's hurting. We've all been, that's what happened with this guy. He was 
He pulled his finger back. He put his finger into a saw turning at about 5,000 revolutions per second. Or per minute, excuse me. It literally scratched the end of his finger. Oh, I mean another tenth of an inch and it would have pulled his hand in and it would have, it would have been disastrous. He didn't mean to do it, but would the consequences still have been there? Absolutely. Sin is like that. God forgives sins. He doesn't hold us to the full consequences of sin frequently, but there are always consequences of sin. Let me give you an example. Uh, If I eat at McDonald's three times a day, double quarter pounder with cheese for breakfast, Big Mac for for lunch, and I'm soon going to really be a big guy, and for dinner I have that new Angus burger they've got with a third pound of beef, and I get maximum french fries for all three meals, and then eventually, two years from now, I say, oh God, I, I now weigh 400 pounds, And I'm really sorry that I've abused my body like this. Is God going to remove the extra 150 or 60 pounds? (laughs) I mean, it's a really cool idea that God would just say, yeah, I would, wouldn't it? You know, I would just let that weight slide. But that's not really the way it works. There's consequences... Even if you didn't mean to do something, there are still... You know, I didn't mean to get to be 400 pounds, but I kind of brought it on myself eating McDonald's three times a day, right? The same thing is true here. Consequences for sin are there, even if it's not an intentional thing. Whereas before this, the person who played a role in someone's death, their life was pretty much over. They were going to be killed. After this... There's consequences, but the consequences, well, you can still live a life. It's just contained in the city. You're not in jail. You've got freedom within the city. The family of your victim cannot come into the city and kill you. As long as you stay in the city, you are safe. And it may seem harsh, but the cities of refuge actually represented a huge step forward in the legal process. And here's the reason why this was such a massive step forward. Remaining in a city of refuge guaranteed a person another chance at life. You could still live a reasonable life, it just wasn't quite the same. Now the person in question here had made a mistake, but thanks to the law, there was still a chance at life. Sometimes things are difficult, are they not? Sometimes what seems impossible actually is for our benefit. I want to read to you an excerpt from, a, from Gary Richmond's book, a view from the zoo in which he describes the birth of a giraffe. The typical newborn giraffe falls nearly 10 feet when it's born. It lands on its back. Within seconds, the little calf rolls to an upright position with his legs tucked under his body. From this position, he carefully considers his world for the first time and shakes himself. The mother giraffe lowers her head to take a quick look. Then she positions herself directly over the calf and kicks him. Sending the baby head over heels, sprawling across the the ground. This vicious process is repeated over and over again. And eventually the calf will stand for the first time on its wobbly legs. Before it's just kind of laying there, but the mother keeps kicking it until it stands up. Now why does the mother do this? Well, it is motivation. Because until that little calf gets on its legs, the mother can't protect it from predators. It's too far down. Once that little calf gets on his legs and is able to start moving, the herd can form around it and that baby can move. So what seems at the moment like an act of vicious a viciousness is actually for the good of the baby.
it's really an amazing thing, but that is what really happens. And in our own lives, don't we sometimes suffer consequences for things that we do that are bad choices? I had a friend who I talked with recently, and they were going through a hard time, and you don't know the person. But this person's going through a hard time, and, and they talked, and some of the difficulty came from some bad choices. Now, it would be very easy for us to say, well, you know, we're, you know, we can be really judgmental, but let's be honest. How many of us have made bad choices? How many of us have done something we knew to be wrong because it's what we wanted to do, and it came back to bite us? Everybody relate? That's what's exactly going on here. This, there are consequences, but God is still showing mercy. And that brings us to the final point of the message. I want us to also understand that mercy is foundational to God. According to Jewish tradition, the roads leading to these cities were always to be kept in excellent condition. And the crossroads were to be well marked with signposts reading, Refuge! Refuge! And an arrow pointing down the direction of the road that you needed to go. In fact, runners were even stationed along the road to guide fugitives on their way to the cities of refuge. Joshua set three cities of refuge on each side of the Jordan River. On the west side, Kadesh was in the north, Shechem was in the middle, Hebron was in the south. On the east side of the Jordan, Golan, Golan was in the north, Ramoth was in the middle, and Bezer was in the south. The reality is the Holy Land was about the size of the state of Maryland. And there were six cities. So the point is, you were never far from a city of refuge. There was always the hope of mercy in this situation if the unthinkable were to happen. There was a way to get there. There was a way. God didn't ignore the fact that justice was to be done. Remember the person who came to the city of refuge who was actually guilty of murder? Wasn't going to find mercy ultimately. There, there was going to be judgment. But the person who was guilty of manslaughter still had a chance. There was something even larger going on here. If they, we aren't careful, we'll miss. And I think it's so important that God wants us to get it, and that's the reason this is in here. Look at this next statement. God's intention was that while we must have a commitment to justice, His people must also be committed to showing mercy. Justice is important, is it not? There have to be rules and there have to be consequences. But we as God's people are also called to show mercy. Our focus up to this point has largely been historical. We've in fact been laying out a foundation for the rest of the sermon because the rest of the morning I want to focus on what I think is the challenge for the church. We are to be Christians who don't look down on other people, but who are willing to love other people where they are. Sometimes people think the church is very judgmental, self-righteous, condescending. Can churches be that way? Yes, they can. They absolutely can. And in fact, if we are not careful although we say we do not want that, we can fall into that trap ourselves. Now, you don't have to raise your hand here, but have you ever caught yourself with somebody who made a mess of things, saying, well, I'm sure glad I never did anything like that. We wouldn't say that out loud, but we think it. We've all been there, haven't we? These cities of refuge were an example of God saying, I want there to be mercy. God, by the way, the key concept, one of the key concepts of the New Testament is the concept of grace. And grace means we show kindness when it's not really deserved. It's not earned. You didn't do something to really get it. God just offers it because He is a God of mercy. But that concept is already being taught here in the Old Testament because mercy is foundational to God. He wants us to understand that. He wants us to move forward with that. Especially in our day, the church needs to be a place that cares for people who have failed. 
and is willing to remind them that he will help if we will only ask for his help. Got a page of my sermon out of order, guys. I'm sorry. There we go. I want to quote from a pastor by the name of Jerry Scott. He wrote this. He said, America is a lonely place. We rush from appointment to appointment, place to place, and then disappear into our living rooms where our best friend is off on the TV. Extended families are often shattered by divorce or unable to function because family members are literally scattered across the country. In a culture where that is increasingly the way things are, the church needs to be a place that cares about people who have failed. Once, twice, three times, four times, five times, ten times, twenty times, fifty times, a hundred times. One of the things I do love about our church is I think we're a pretty accepting congregation. I don't mean by that that we will accept sin. Sin is always wrong. Let me be really blunt about that. Sin is wrong. God hates sin, but he absolutely loves sinners. We're to do the same. We are to hate sin. Sin causes problems. Sin will cause you grief. You, you can bank on it. God gave rules because rules, what's right is right, and if you don't do what's right, you will get hurt. Haven't we all experienced that? But even though, God, even though that's what happens, God is also a God of mercy. When we mess up, He is like the father in the story of the prodigal son. He's standing at the door, looking out the window of the house, watching for us to come back to Him. And when we take a step toward Him, what does God do? He comes running to welcome us back home. But we still have to be willing to come. That's the tension that always exists in stories like this. Now, that all leads me to the, what is one of the key statements I want you to understand in this morning's sermon. Look at your notes. Churches today are to be modern cities of refuge. We are to be modern cities of refuge. Now, probably everybody here is nodding in agreement because we all agree that we want to be a, play, a safe place, that we want to love people who had messed up, right? Everybody nod your heads. Right. We all want to be that kind of... We want to be those kind of people. We want to be that kind of church. People are looking for that kind of church. Not a church that waters down the truth, but a church that loves people in spite of the fact that they're not perfect. And who acknowledges we're not perfect either. But sometimes the details of how that all works out can be a little difficult. It can be a little frustrating because, well, let me give you some examples. What if into our church next Sunday walks a person who is struggling with all kinds of addictions? Will we let him know we love him regardless? I sure hope so. What if we have a homosexual come and they're struggling with their lifestyle? Now, God's really clear homosexuality is not right. But does God love homosexuals? Absolutely. We should too. That doesn't mean we lower the standards, it means we increase our love. See the difference? What about a rebellious teenage girl who dresses to shock? Seen any of those? Oh yeah. Now, and let me tell you the let me tell you the struggle, where the struggle comes. You know, in a situation like any of these, we look at that individual and we say, Well, I don't want them to influence I don't want them to influence the others, right? But make no mistake about it, when we become judgmental and hateful, we're also spreading negative influence. That's not what God called us to do. God is the judge, not us. Now, does that mean we don't know what's right and wrong? No. When He has laid out what's right and wrong, we live by what He has laid out, right? 
But we also are to love like he loves. What did he do with the woman who was caught in the act of adultery? And those men threw her in front of Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Did Jesus look down at that woman and say, You moral mess, you. When Jesus met the woman at the well, remember? Remember she was at the well because she had been ostracized by the ungodly Samaritans because she was more ungodly than they were. Did Jesus write her off? Or did he reach out to her with love? When Jesus was in ministry, he was at the home of, I believe it was Simon the Pharisee, and there was a woman came in who was known to be a sinful woman. We're not told exactly what that was, but a lot of Bible scholars think she was probably a prostitute. And she came up to Jesus, and she knelt down before him, and she began to wash his feet with the tears that were coming down her cheeks, and then she began to dry his feet with her hair. Did Jesus show mercy or judgment? See, it all goes back to this concept we're looking at. We are called to be people who stand up for truth. All too often today, the church is known for standing against sin and not known at all for showing mercy to sinners. Please hear me. We become ungodly when we go to either extreme. There are churches who have fallen into the trap as they don't stand for anything. They accept everything regardless of how clear Scripture is. You've seen that, haven't you? I mean, look at some of the debates that go on about things which the Bible clearly defines as, as wrong. And then there are those who go the opposite direction and they are hateful with people who are trying to change. That's just as ungodly. God calls us to examine our own selves, realize that we are each a mess, and then show mercy and love to people who are also a mess. Okay, you're, most of you are just staring at me. I want you to nod your head yes. That is what we are called to do. We are called to be people of mercy. Even as we stand for truth, we are also to stand for God's love and communicate that God doesn't write people off when they fail. And we are all a testament to that reality. Churches today are to be modern cities of refuge. To be a city of refuge, we need to love people where they are. Yes, do we need to tell them the truth about sin? Absolutely. But we start with love. There's an old statement that's it's really a classic. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's a golden statement. It's true. If you love somebody, they will listen to you. If you judge somebody, they will never listen to you at all. The first part of the morning's message focused on understanding the history of what happened. The last part is focused on putting it into practice in our lives. Now, I want to go back to the historical point for just a moment because I believe it's what I'm getting ready to share really illustrates how necessary it is to carefully walk this balance. Final statement in your notes. There's no record in the Old Testament of the cities of refuge ever being used. Although they most certainly were. But the lack of an example of their use suggests that we're better at talking about mercy than we are at showing mercy. Folks, we are called to show mercy. And do you know the very foundation for showing mercy? It's recognizing the truth about you and me recognizing the truth about me. I can be judgmental until I start looking at the truth about Tim Richards. You can be judgmental as long as you ignore the truth about you. Anybody here ever done something you're really embarrassed about? Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. And I'm not going to ask you to share. 
We've all been there, have we not? I've said things that I'm ashamed of. Unkind things. And I'm only telling you that because I know you've done the same. Not the exact same things, but you have said things that you regretted. My attitude at times has been not just bad, it's been lousy, stinking bad. Hasn't yours? I've been angry before and said things that afterwards I thought, Oh my gosh, I wish I had just kept my mouth shut. Haven't you? Uh, spouses, you're not allowed to look at one another right now. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. The secret is to never forget that we all have a problem with selfishness and sin. I want to conclude with a story. It's a fantasy told by a woman by the name of Tazera Ruff about an aging Far Eastern Emperor. He decided as he was getting older that he needed to do something. He needed to find a replacement who would be honest and who would help his people move forward. So he called all the young children in the kingdom together and said, I want to find an honest replacement because I know a few years from now I'm going to be old and I'm going to pass from this life and I want to find a young protege that I can spend the last few years instilling leadership in, but they need to first of all be honest. He said, I've decided to choose one of you. And so over the next, over the next year, I'm going to give each of you children a seed. And I want you to plant the seed. And a year from now, you will bring back the seeds and show me the plant that you have grown. Make it the very best possible plant possible. So each child came forward and the emperor gave to each one a little seed. And he said, take this to your home. Plant it carefully. Water it carefully. Bring it back to me next year. And show me the plant that you have grown. One little boy named Ling came up and got his seed. And as he looked at the seed, he was, it was so exciting. There was so much potential. Little Ling, like all the other children, took his seed home. He told his mother what the emperor had said. He said, Mother, let's buy potting soil. I will water the seed every day. I will put it in the sun every morning. I will bring it in every night. Mother, I'm going to grow the most beautiful plant you have ever seen. And the mother said, let's get the potting soil. And so they got the potting soil. They got, they got a, a pot to put the to put the potting soil in and to plant the little seed in. And Ling carefully from day one did exactly what he said. He set the plant outside. He, he watered it. Left it out all day. Brought it back in. After a week, still nothing had popped through the soil. He continued doing the same thing every day. Three weeks later, nothing he began to hear from friends about how wonderful their plants were doing. Every morning he continued doing what he had been doing. He watered, he put it outside every night. He brought it back in in case possibly it might grow. Two months in, his friends began to bring around and show him the beautiful plants that are starting to grow. They're, they're up this far many different kinds of plants. They're all over the place. They're, they're beautiful. And they would ask Ling, Ling, where is your plant? And he would say, mine has never come up. Six months in, the plants were starting to, to get large and be really beautiful in some of the pots. And little Ling, every morning he takes his pot outside. He waters the seed. Every night he brings it back in and it never grows. Finally, a year has passed. Ling's mother said, son, you, you did everything you could do. You should go to the ceremony. Take your pot with you. If you are asked, you simply tell the truth. I watered it every day. I set it out every day. I brought it in every night, but it just didn't grow. 
as Ling walked in with all the other children, he was surrounded by beautiful plants. Some tall, some wide, some growing things. It was beautiful. And there is Ling with his little pot with a seed that never sprouted. The emperor looked around the room and as he was looking around the room he saw the pot with nothing in it. And he sent his guards to bring little Ling to the front and Ling knew at that moment that he was probably going to be punished for daring to show up with nothing. But the emperor brought Ling to the front. He set him right in front of him and he silenced the crowd and he said, One year ago today I gave each of you a seed. All the seeds have been boiled, so there was no chance that any of them would grow. The beautiful plants you see around you were seeds you replaced. Ling will be the new emperor. Because he was willing to do what he knew was right. And the rest of you... You replaced my seed. The reality is we all have replaced seeds many times when we thought it would make us look bad. Have we not? We've put on a face. We've put on a smile. We have acted nice to people that we have gossiped about. We have acted merciful when we were actually judgmental. We have acted godly when we were in reality ungodly. We have acted like we prayed a lot when in fact we didn't pray. We have acted like we knew more than we actually knew. We have been judgmental rather than people of mercy. But God is going to use our church to be what he wants it to be. We must be people of mercy. The great news is that God is a God of mercy, is he not? If you don't know him as your savior, I want you to know you can invite him into your heart and it doesn't matter how bad the past is, he willingly comes. And when you fail after you are a follower of his and you come back to him and say, please forgive me, what does God do? He forgives. He shows mercy.